Hello everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy and we're continuing the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, Master's explanation explained by Swami Kriyananda. So we are now up to the second, sta- we're still in the second chapter of the Gita. We're up to stanza 58. We're still in the chapter of the book called The Nature of Right Action. As you can well imagine, the nature of right action takes a long time. So we're still working on it. Um, when the yogi, like a tortoise, withdrawing its head and limbs into its shell, is able to withdraw his energy from the objects of sense perception, he becomes established in wisdom. Now this is a very important chapter uh, stanza, especially when you see all the ones that have come before, and immediately before at number 57, 257. He who under all circumstances is without attachment, and is neither elated by goodness nor depressed by evil, is a man of established wisdom. And so what follows immediately in the Gita is when the yogi, like a tortoise, withdrawing his head and limbs into its shell, is able to withdraw his energy from the object of sense perception, he becomes established in wisdom. So what's following, what's being expressed here, as Swami explains it, is the fact that the Gita isn't merely just saying, do it. The Gita is also explaining to us how it's done. So to simply say, you know, be detached from grief, be indifferent um, to success, be the same in in trial and in happiness. I mean, it all sounds really good, but you also uh, are are left a little bewildered um, because how do we go about it? So the Gita tells us the yogi, like a tortoise, withdraws inside its shell. Um, I don't know if any of you ever had little turtles as um, pets. I, I took care of somebody else's turtle once. That was my only experience with one. But they are really quite remarkable in the way that they put their little feet and their little head out and they crawl along. But as soon as they're threatened, they just go inside that shell. When I grew up in El Paso, Texas, growing up in El Paso, Texas, there were a lot of desert turtles out there, and I remember finding them out in the desert as a child, and as soon as they realized that something was disturbing them, they just went inside that shell, and then you could pick up that shell, and you could sort of know that there was somebody in there, but it was completely, um, it was completely protected, it was completely insura- insulated, and completely unrelated to anything that was going on outside of it. It was just inside this protective reality. So what the Gita is giving us when they're giving us that image, which Swami then explains at great length in the commentary, and we'll go over it a little bit more, is they're they're talking about an inherent potential in human nature that the average person never explores, but the yogi um, utilizes in order to in order to become, in order to to obtain the state of consciousness that the Gita is offering us as what it looks like to be established in divine wisdom. Yes, that's his word, established in wisdom. So in order to explain this, we have to start talking, as Swami does now in the commentary, about many of the more esoteric aspects of the yogic path. And One thing you have to remember about the path of self-realization, especially as Swami Kriyananda teaches it, is that um, the essential principles are not complicated. Between the principles not being complicated and it actually being easy easy to execute, um, there's a a very large and expansive space. So what this... Uh, stanza of the Gita is referring to can be easily explained in just a few principles. But the the realization of those few principles is what the entire path of yoga is about. And what Swami is also saying, the mere fact that the Gita references them tells you that, that above all, what the Gita is concerned about is the inner path. Okay, So that, that's what we're working with here. <clears throat> so, Swami starts with the word pranayama. And pranayama is a very, is one of uh, 
Patanjali's eight branches of practice. And pranayama is a very common word in, uh, in, in the yoga science. Um, prana is, is generally associated with the concept of breath. But in fact, uh, prana really means energy. Breath is just a symbol of energy. And in the practice of yoga, breath is one of the ways that we access the energy. But breath is more, an, even in itself, is an outer symbol of what prana really is. And sometimes people think that pranayama are breathing exercises and the, the practices that we do. But what pranayama actually means in Patanjali's system is when we gain actual control of the breath. We're not just um, controlling it in the sense of doing an exercise that gives us a little bit of influence over it. It's actually getting to the point where we have mastery over our energy. So that just like the turtle, we're completely withdrawn from this world. Um, so what, what he, the, the phrase he uses, he says pranayama is not a technique. Pranayama is a condition. It's a state of consciousness in which we have complete mastery over our energy. Um, so he says that the whole practice of pranayama is based on what he calls a very intimate connection uh, between the breath and our, our energy and the breath and our feelings and our reactions to the world and the breath and the heart, the heartbeat, and how the state of the heart also um, strongly influences our response to the world. So what we have to do to understand what this really means is uh, to really understand what you would call the, the physiology, the metaphysic, metaphysics of breath control. And Swami also makes a strong point here that there are pranayams, as people would commonly call them, which is breathing exercises, which are based on, on holding the breath, withholding the breath it, one way or another. But that in itself is not control of energy in the sense that if you're holding the breath by an act of will, sooner or later that act of will will expire and the breath will reassert itself. To withdraw the energy and therefore withdraw the energy even from the need to breathe, that's what real mastery of our energy is. You know, it's an interesting fact. The breath, the breath is an interesting element because it's between our conscious and our unconscious control. We can influence the breath by specific uh, pranayams, by specific breathing techniques. We can influence whether we breathe or not by an act of will, by holding the breath. Um, but at a certain point, the breath uh, it, it reasserts itself. Um, a, a, a morbid way to put it is that you can't commit suicide by holding your breath. If you hold your breath and deprive yourself of oxygen, at a certain point, you're, you're, it will, that, dep that oxygen deprivation will cause you to black out. And as soon as you black out and your conscious mind is no longer able to influence you, you will immediately begin to breathe again. Because it, it can be influenced, but it can't be controlled by external methods. But it can be controlled by internal methods. So Swamiji explains to us this physiology which it's extremely worthwhile to know. So I'm going to just give it to you in, in, uh, you know, in a very general way. In Swamiji's um, Art and Science of Raja Yoga, which some of you are familiar with, but I'll just hold the book up. Art and Science of Raja Yoga. Swami really talks in much more detail about the metaphysics of, of pranayama and breath control, and he gives instructions and so on. Right now what I'm going to tell you is as much as we need to know in order to be able to think about this properly. So the breath, um, it, there's, there's three essential elements of the spine for, this, for the purposes of this discussion. There's two what they call outer nerve channels, which are the ida and the pingala. The, the inhalation on the left side is the ida, the exhalation on the right side is the pingala. Um, Swami calls these the superficial, I think he calls them the superficial nerve channels, but they're, they're more outward 
than the, the single channel, which is called the Shushumna, which is much deeper. Now, even though there are physical c counterparts to these that can be seen on the physical body, the Irda, the Pingala, and the Shushumna are, are, are aspects of the non-physical body, of the astral body. It's the pattern upon which the physical body is based and, and the, um, the inner reality that activates the, the material expression of things. Everything in creation has causal, astral, and physical reality. And the m material, physical reality is the last expression. It, it appears to us to be the biggest and the most influential, but it's actually the effect of the other two levels rather than the cause of them. So we move back for understanding the breath and the irda and the pingala. Now, life itself is dependent on breath. When a baby is born, um, the, uh, the, w the weight is for that baby's first cry because the baby can look, the child's body can look perfect, but until that body actually takes a breath, there's concern as to whether or not the, the incarnation is actually going to be launched. So people think of it in terms of the, the baby's first cry, but Master makes it more subtle. The actual starting point is the first inhalation. And the first inhalation is puts us in relationship to the material world. And then for the rest of our uh, incarnation, our lifespan, we are constantly inhaling and exhaling. And the incarnation begins, the baby is separated from the mother's body, is taken out of the womb and has to breathe on its own. It inhales and at the last point of the incarnation, there will be a final exhalation because what we are entering into is this world of duality. And to be in the material world at all, we are, we are working in the world of opposites. So there has to be an initial inhalation, there has to be a final exhalation. And on both sides of that equation, you know, those who love the, the incarnated soul are waiting for the baby to inhale, and at the other side of it, you're waiting for the person to exhale for the final time. And I've been present at both sides of that equation, and both have this extraordinary um, sense of ordinary life having been ripped apart. It's, it's like you suddenly enter into this tunnel between the worlds. And, and no matter how blasé one wants to be about it, it's, it, it's just the way it is. I've, I've done that, the vigil on both sides of it actually, but thinking now of the vigil waiting for someone to die, and how incredibly, extraordinarily attentive one gets to the inflow and the outflow of breath, and how profoundly everything about that person's incarnation suddenly just comes down to this inflow and outflow of breath. And as long as it continues, then the soul is connected to that body. And then when that final exhalation comes in, in physical death, then it's over. That soul is disconnected, just as the soul connected itself and disconnected it. Someone was saying recently that um, some, when people are often talking about opposites, they often talk about life and death. But uh, the person, and I don't, unfortunately, I can't remember where I read this, but the actual opposition is birth and death. The, the actual pair of opposites is not life and death, but birth and death, because it's all life. There really is no opposite to life. Everything, life continues, but birth and death are really the opposite points. And they're, they're a beautiful balance point in our, in our increasingly enlightened society. By no means are we enlightened yet, but our, in our increasingly enlightened society in the West especially, a far greater understanding of death is now beginning to come in. Hospice has become common, people dying at home, a much greater understanding of reincarnation and the continuation of the soul and just uh, a, a greater willingness by no means across the board but in in growing circles a greater willingness to confront death bravely 
and openly rather than feeling it's something to be hidden away or to be ashamed of. Because it's the opposite of birth. It's the, it's the, it's the partner. I'll put it on one. It's the complementary. It's the complementary to birth. If there's going to be physical birth, there's going to be physical death. It's just the complementary. When a child is born, you expect that child to grow up. You don't expect that child to remain a child forever. And if, if the child does, either mentally or physically, then you, you consider that there's something greatly wrong because there's a natural trajectory that takes us from one to its complementary on the other side. And yet, strangely, when we're born, we're, we, we're reluctant to just embrace the complementary other side of it, which is as an incarnation begins, so it ends. So this breath, which is between conscious and unconscious, and this breath, which is the very definition of life itself, is also the avenue, especially when we understand it metaphysically. Now, the physical breath, you know, has a physical function with oxygen and releasing the, uh, what, the, the, the waste products back out into the carbon dioxide, back into the world, I believe that's the right word, um, back, you know, into the atmosphere. But, but according to the yogis, what actually causes the breath to happen is this constant upward and downward flow of life force in the irdha and the pingala. As long as the life force is flowing up and down, then we will breathe. Every time there's an upward moving energy in the irdha, we inhale a downward moving energy in the pingala, we exhale. So when those astral energies are stilled, um, usually when those astral energies are stilled, it's because the soul is, is extracting itself from the body. The body and the soul are separating. I know when a friend of mine was at the end of her life and was dealing with cancer and was trying, uh, felt guided by God to do everything she could to try to stay in her body, but uh, it was not possible. And at a certain point when physical conditions were had deteriorated beyond redemption, I just asked her the question, does it feel to you like your soul is trying to stay in your body or like your soul is trying to get out? Oh, she said, it's trying to get out. And then at that point, in just a matter of moments, she just turned her direction. She had felt that she was supposed to try to stay in it. Now she felt she was supposed to help her soul exit. So she just shifted her attention. Now in ordinary life, when the soul exits from the body, um, that's what we call death. But in, on, in the yogi's life, because that astral energy, um, if we withdraw far enough back into the astral and into the more subtle realms, the physical body may stop breathing and the heart may slow down even to the point where it stops, but the body doesn't die. It's, it's more like the yogi has gone like a tortoise way back into its shell, and so the life form doesn't show outside the shell, but the life, the life is still in there. It's just cut itself off from interacting with what we normally call objective reality. Now, I'm simply not qualified to really speak about that state at length. I can, I can reference it, but I, I don't experience it, so I can't speak of it. So I'm going to keep the conversation more on the level that is useful to me, and I hope also useful to you. Now this upward and downward movement of energy in the spine is also very closely related, the, the irda and the pingala, the upward and downward movement of energy, which results in inhalation and exhalation, is very closely related to what we call the reactive process. And the, the reactive process is what the Gita has been uh, talking to us about in all of these previous chapters, um, e neither elated by goodness nor depressed by evil, um, when he's withdrawn, abides unshaken in soul bliss, he has discrimination, he's not influenced by the opinions of others, wholly contented in the self. All of these different phrases are describing someone who remains constantly centered, and that even though this world is a, a sea of ups and downs, the yogi, like the tortoise, remains very calmly centered in himself. Now, the metaphysics of, of what that's about is as long as the energy is flowing up in the, the irda and down in the pingala, and inhalation and exhalation is taking place, 
the the person is bound by these opposites. And we can see how it acts out in a very simple way. You know, whenever we're um, pleased about something, we tend to inhale. It's, it's like if you're an actress and you're on the stage and you're trying to show that you're happy about something, you express it with a, an inhalation of energy. And whenever we're discouraged about something, just instinctively we go, oh, like that. And we, we're exhaling. We may make that sound, but it's an exhalation that follows. And when you watch little children, <gasps> they get so excited about something. That's always what you do. It's the upward moving energy. When you have a positive experience, the energy rises. When you have a negative experience, the energy falls. Now, Swami points out that we don't have a positive experience every time we inhale and the negative every time we exhale because we would be going like a blinking light, just constantly frowning, smiling, frowning, smiling, frowning, smiling. So there's sort of a longer rhythm that we're working with. But the mere fact that w- w- what, what the point that is trying to be made here, and this is the most important point, is that even though the experience appears to be happening in the world around us, what actually causes the experience is the inner flow of energy. So, so something happens outside and what happens is energy rises within me. I inhale, energy comes up, and I feel really positive. And I'm not really thinking about the energy making me feel better. I'm thinking that that happened and therefore I feel better. But if that happened and, the, and I didn't allow the energy to rise, or I rejected the energy, or I deliberately pulled the energy down, I wouldn't have the same experience, because what we're really always experiencing is the energy. Now, this energy is also, because there's this very close relationship between the heart and the breath, and when a, a yogi has mastery over his physical and emotional processes, he can control both the breath and the heartbeat. When Master was uh, first in the United States in the 20s, and he went on his uh, lecture campaigns, spiritual campaigns, back and forth across the United States, and he spoke in almost, in, in most of the major, or many, I should say, of the major American cities, and he, he, he filled the largest halls in those cities, you know, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Detroit, um, on the West Coast, Washington, and Denver, just everywhere. I mean, Seattle in Washington, in Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And one of the reasons that he did was that he often did remarkable demonstrations of his transcendence of ordinary physical conditions. He would, uh, in, he would ask, are there any doctors in the, in the audience? And then he would have the doctors come up onto the stage and he would stop his breath. He would stop his heartbeat. And he would, uh, on occasion, he would have a pulse on one side and no pulse on the other or different pulses on different sides of his body. I mean, he just played with um, things that most people don't even know are happening what to speak of being able to control them. But as a yogi, he was completely, as a a self-realized master, he was completely in command of his physical energy. His physical energy was an expression of his more subtle energy, and he had complete mastery over his subtle energy. So when a great yogi, when his breath stops, often his heart can also stop, because they're all related to the necessity for the physical body to take in oxygen and release the carbon dioxide and the other waste products. But when, in whatever way, and I I really am getting beyond my portfolio here so I can only refer to it, however it works, it stops. So coming back to the way that I understand it and find it useful, in yoga and in life we begin to understand that our reactive process is reflected in the mind, but it's actually controlled from the heart, from the heart chakra. Uh, Not the physical heart per se, but the heart chakra, which is the force behind the physical heart. And the heart chakra is is where 
we hold our likes and our dislikes. And what completely bound, binds us um, to this material world is the fact that instead of seeing the oneness of spirit behind it, we're always seeing the dualities. And again, referring to the earlier chapters of the Gita, that's what they're all talking about. Stepping back from these dualities and recognizing that there's a single thread of consciousness that acts in, in terms of these opposites, but is never, it never really becomes them. It, it is not changed by them. But the heart, where lives our fears and our preferences, we develop um, attractions and aversions. Just a moment, I think I'm going to sneeze. There, I think it passed. Um, we develop these attractions and aversions. Swamiji said once that when we meditate, we think about calming the mind. He said, but it's actually the heart that has to be calmed. Master put it another way. He said, he put it this way, he said, reason follows feeling. When the heart is agitated, the mind is agitated. And the heart becomes agitated when I want this and I fear that and I don't want this and I do want that. The reactive process exists in the heart and that reactive process in the heart stimulates the breath. That's why when we can pull back from the breath, then the heart also goes into a state of complete calmness. So what we're working with in trying to become like the tortoise and therefore, therefore being established in wisdom, wisdom and not tossed about on the waves of duality is to understand that if we can gain mastery over the, the up and down flow of energy and if we can gain mastery over the likes and dislikes of the heart, then, then w- see, there's two ways to concentrate on it. One way to concentrate on it is to train yourself to be accepting of what the world gives you. I remember uh, Swami Kriyananda was uh, very disciplined and he was disciplined also for our sakes, both for the example and for the um, instruction that he set, which was to feel that everything that came to him came from Divine Mother. And as much as possible, not not to resist, not to judge. Now that doesn't mean that he was passive in the face of obstacles, by no means. But he, he didn't allow himself to fear or to like or dislike different things. If it was given to him, then he would deal with it. He would just accept and deal with whatever God gave him. He would use the example that when you're playing tennis and someone hits the a ball to your side of the net, you don't stop and say, I don't like the way you hit that ball. You just rush over and you respond. And that's how a a yogi lives, which is wherever the ball is hit, you rush over and you respond to it. You don't just say, I don't like it that way. I want you to hit it over here. And no, but nor do you just stand there and let it just go out of the court without any response from you. So that's what we're talking about. When we talk about neutralizing the likes and dislikes of the heart, we just are able to respond equally without corrupting our response by all these, uh, I want it, I don't want it. Now, easier said than done. This is a whole lifetime of practice. I remember in one particular instance, and the precise circumstances, I don't remember exactly. It may have been when we were under uh, a lot of litigation and during the 12 year span when we were fighting lawsuits. It could have just been financial crises. There were so many different things (laughs) that challenged the existence of Ananda that by now they've kind of blended in together. Not really, but you understand. But it was one of those times when there was an enormous amount of, of external obstacles that had to be hit. A lot, of, a lot of balls were being hit into the corners of the court and we were running back and forth trying to respond to them. And uh, Swamiji went to the dentist and he didn't have any cavities. <laughs> and I said, thank the Lord for little favors. You know, just a stupid joke in the moment. Swami, absolutely, he would have none of it. He became so stern, really stern. He said, I thank Divine Mother for everything she sends me. Wow. I mean, just a little comment like that, which is just a cliche. It's like I'd rather have this than than that. 
Swami said, no. Everything comes from Divine Mother. I accept everything. And that's what you do with the heart. Whatever comes to me in this world, it's from Divine Mother. I mean, we, we say that as an aphorism or as an affirmation. Um, even it can sound to some people as if you're, you're just sort of being fatuous and trying to deny the reality of life, but they don't understand it on the subtle level in which it's intended. How could anything that happens in this world be outside of the will of God? How could anything that happens to us be sent to us for any reason other than our ultimate spiritual benefit? Now, these are not easy things to understand. You know, the, the, the inexorable, absolute fairness of the law of karma is Ph.D. level yoga. You can kind of get the law of karma and you kind of like it and it, you people start using it and it works, but that absolutely everything for not only for you, but for everyone you love and everybody on the planet happens exactly as it has to happen for the ultimate spiritual salvation of every single person involved. That is very hard to understand and very hard to accept. My advice to people usually is don't try. I mean, on the spiritual path, we are allowed, and, and Master himself put it just exactly like this. He said, try it out. You know, listen to what's being said and test it. Be like a scientist in his laboratory. Don't take other people's word for it. Do the experiment yourself and see what the results are. And Master wasn't just being uh, generous or... It wasn't a technique for winning people to the cause. It is the only way you can be on the spiritual path. Because otherwise, something will happen that will, will push you beyond superficial platitudes. It's, it's very easy to read and remember and repeat. It's very much harder to respond appropriately. I mean, and respond... Well, there's two ways of responding. One way to respond is consciously with discipline, with an awareness of the fact that I understand that I have choices here, but I'm going to raise my energy to respond in this way. Now, we also have to understand that to raise your energy to respond is quite different than to have something come up and suppress it. Because you see, that's actually driving the energy down. But when we raise our energy, when, when we draw our energy up toward the spiritual eye, when we lift our energy, which is what the inhalation is about, but we also have to in, inhale and exhale while we do it. But on a deeper level, we're raising our energy to the spiritual eye. Watch. When things happen that agitate us, they pull us out from our center and then they pull us down from our center. You, you know, you feel it in your gut. You feel it just, you, you feel it lower in yourself than at the spiritual eye. And what, when we can consciously, in the midst of challenge, pull back into our spine and then lift that energy higher, then circumstances remain the same and we can still perceive them as they are. You see, this is not being Pollyanna. And this is not just wishful thinking. And this is not putting your head in the sand. You can still perceive things exactly as you are. You know where the tennis ball has landed. You know how hard you're going to have to run to get there in time and exactly what you're going to have to do to get it back onto the other side of the net. You're not just saying, oh, yeah, I'll just sort of wish it back across and then just let the game crash. But we don't bother to say, I don't want it to be like this. Because if it comes from God, why would we want it to be otherwise? No, this is a lifelong practice. But at least we know what we're trying to do. And this Gita uh, verse, this, this chapter, and Swami's commentary on it, begins to tell us how to respond. Um, Swamiji himself, this is a, a smaller example, and not a life-threatening one, but an interesting one. He would often tell the story of a trip he took to India, it may have been in 1972, or maybe it was a little later than that. But he, uh, I think it was a little later, actually. And he, 
He was supposed to be met in Calcutta by certain friends of his, but as it happened, he found out later they'd been delayed in traffic. So he lands in Calcutta, and he has all these arrangements. These people are going to meet him and take them, his friends, take them to his ho their home and so on, and there's no one there at all. He's just all by himself there in Calcutta. And he was traveling by himself, and his, his principle of this trip was that he was traveling with Divine Mother, that he really wasn't alone, that the whole journey was a journey with her. So he himself says that usually if plans go awry, you try to find a telephone. This was before cell phones, but you try to find a telephone and you call your friends and you ask them, where are you? I'm standing here. Where are you standing? How can we get together? You try to make something happen. Swamiji said instead, he just saw that instead of being met and having all the arrangements follow through, it, it, it all seemingly fallen apart. And so he just said very quietly to himself, Divine Mother, what is it that you want? And in that moment, he said, just as he was standing there, a man came up to him and said, Are you Swami Kriyananda? And it was a man that Swami had never met. It turned out they had a mutual friend who was a man who, who lived in California that Swami had hoped to meet in India but had no way of contacting him. It turns out this, this stranger uh, had seen a photograph from Dr. Mishra, who was Swami's friend. Dr. Mishra was visiting in Calcutta, and so this stranger took Swami home to Dr. Mishra's house, and everything just worked out beautifully. Swamiji said if he had thought immediately of how to do something about this, responded to it and tried to make it different, he said he probably wouldn't have been standing there with the man when the man came by and recognized him. But instead, he took his energy in from the up and down of the external world and just said really simply, Divine Mother, what do you want? Just as he'd said to me, I thank God for everything that happens. Now that, uh, that capacity not to react requires that we have some habitual control over the I impulsive feeling of the heart and then therefore the uh, inevitable up and down of the energy and the, the breathing. I mean, when people are agitated, they breathe hard. You know, that's what happens when you're agitated is your, your breath is going up and down all the time and you're not, nothing in you is like the tortoise pulling back in. So these are the, um, th this very basic, and then all the pranayams that we do, all the, the exercises that are in the Raja Yoga book and all through many, many practices of yoga, cause you to sit down, to become aware of that in, inflow and outflow of breath, and either in, in some meditation practice that we teach, like the Hong Sa meditation, you simply observe it. And by observing it, you gradually withdraw your energy, just like the turtle. You withdraw your energy from the external world and you become intensely conscious of the fact that your whole reality can just be reduced to this inhalation and exhalation. And we add to that practice uh, a, a mantra, a Hong Sa mantra, which affirms that I, the individual spirit, am one with the infinite. And so we realize that with every breath we take, that that very life force flows into us from a divine source. And our seeming separateness is only because we've moved away from that source and are so involved in the up and down. But the more we are conscious of that simple up and down flow. So on the deeper spiritual level, when we're trying to uh, gain mastery over the irda and the pingala, mastery begins by conscious awareness. And whether we actually feel it um, in its more subtle form, or we merely um, intuit it by observing the up and down flow of the breath, what we've done by living even for the span of a meditation in the simple fact of up and down breathing, in and out breathing, is that we're living in the up and down flow of energy. And if we're living inside the up and down flow of energy, then it doesn't activate all of that um, unproductive riding of the waves of life. We become like the turtle. 
Master calls it shutting off the sense telephones, <laughs> which is sort of a, an amusing way to think about it. But it's through our senses, in their perception of the world, that all these messages are brought back to us. This is why when we sit to meditate and we're striving to have our consciousness be internally centered, we close our eyes, we often block our ears, either with a, a mudra or with a ear, uh, earphones or earplugs, or just by trying to create silence around us if we can, we don't speak. Sometimes we use incense because the um, sense of smell is very evocative. And if we can begin to associate um, the, sense, the smell of incense with inward consciousness, you know, many times ancient memories are activated, old memories are activated when you smell something that you smelled in a different circumstance. So we use that particular sense, can be used with incense if you wish, to uh, draw you inward. Um, other pleasant smells like the smell of baking bread or chocolate chip cookies or um, vegetable stew are also evocative, but they, they draw you out into your senses instead of uh, drawing you back inside. So when we, um, the simplest kind of meditation where we're walking, watching the breath or the pranayama exercises where we become aware by deliberate concentration and then by deliberate action of our ability to raise and to, to be in that upward and downward flow of energy, then that becomes a, a, a habit. It goes into our subconscious so that when life challenges us, you know, rather than just being drawn out and spun out by what our sense telephones have perceived and they all start ringing at the same time, instead of that, it will occur to us that if I can control the up and down flow of energy. In other words, if I can control the reactive process, that's what it is. The up and down flow of energy is the reactive process. One of our dear sisters, um, who spiritual sisters who um, had a recurrence, second or third recurrence of cancer, and it went into her brain. And she was extraordinarily brave and detached about it. Um, it came on, she was living very actively, and then suddenly she had these symptoms. She intuitively knew immediately that it was the cancer and that it returned, that it was in her brain. And she, she died four or six weeks later. She just knew she would. And uh, her husband was naturally attached to her and was not pleased at the prospect that she would be leaving so soon. But just in a very yogic way, she just said simply, control the reactive process. I mean, it's not a very... In, in one sense, it's not what you think of as a romantic goodbye, but in another sense, what a great gift to give to someone you love. You know, we've had a life together, and now my karma is taking me away, and if you fall outward from this response and become completely engaged in the ups and downs in it, it will separate us. But if you can control that reactive process and, and just as she was slowly withdrawing or, or rapidly, as it were, withdrawing from the capacity to relate to the outside world, the more he as a yogi could withdraw also, the more they would, their unity would remain, even if the physical form would change and the form of their relationship therefore would be altered, their relationship was the life force. And the more each of them could live in that life force, um, the more powerful that connection would be. So w what I was, uh, I, w I, I touched on this a moment ago and I'm going to come back to it now. You know, this also has to do with the chakras and it has to do with where we identify. As Swami said, we don't identify with every upward and downward breath with positive, negative, positive, and negative, as Swami describes it, we tend to reside sort of more or less in one or another of the chakras. And, and people kind of have a, uh, an overall inclination. If we're more sensually oriented, if we're more body oriented, we tend to reside more in the lower three chakras because those are the chakras that are uh, closer to, to the earth element. 
Uh, this isn't a class in the chakras. It's more subtle and complicated than that. Um, uh, on my YouTube channel, there's a there's a four part course on the chakras, which is, if you haven't already studied them in depth, you might find that useful. Um, but the the closer we are to the earth element, which is the first chakra, the more we're identified with fixed form the more we live through the physical world, the more we experience life through the senses. The higher we are from the heart up to the spiritual eye through the medulla, the more we identify with the non-physical reality, the energy that is us. So the ideal in spiritual life is as much as possible to identify with the spiritual eye. And even when we feel that downward pulling energy and even even just a little practice of yoga, just a little bit of, I don't just mean physical postures, but yoga in the sense of the, the, the attempt to unify our consciousness, our limited consciousness with an infinite consciousness, we begin to become aware of, of essentially where on that spectrum our consciousness is centered. And partly we just feel it physically. It's very interesting even to watch yourself walk, pay attention to how you walk or watch other people walk because we tend, our walk tends to reflect where our consciousness is centered. And if we feel that our consciousness is centered too low in our body, it's, it's a good practice to try to have your consciousness be centered higher in your body, even to walk from your heart or, or walk from an expanded sense of the fifth chakra at the throat or above all walk with a sense of unity with God instead of a heavy sort of hitting the ground hard and moving sort of with our hips forward. Uh, I don't, if you, if you observe and if you practice in yourself, you'll really be able to see that you can center your consciousness in different chakras and then you'll manifest differently. Now, the egoic self is, uh, the, when the sperm and ovum come together, they come together at the medulla. That's where the, that's where the first you know, the single cells unite, and this is where the life force begins from, at the medulla. And the medulla and the spiritual eye, the Master says most interestingly, are the same chakra, but they're the opposite poles of the same chakra. And the medulla is where our ego self rests. And ego is not just egotistical. Ego is, you know, that spark of divinity. Our individual soul is the best word we have, jiva, is a, a Sanskrit word which is more accurate, which is our little bit of individuality. It's, it's rests at the medulla. And if it stays at the medulla, we become very egoic. We become very involved with ourselves. And this is where when, when we're worried, we get tense like this. You can feel it. You'll get a headache back in here. People who are all, many um, languages, many phrases that have to do with how snobby people are. They look down their nose at people. You've got your nose in the air like that. Beneath the nose is how people will say it in some languages. Because there's tension here and it pulls the head back. And the universal gesture of humility is to release the tension here and to bow like that. But what we need to do, because this is where we, we, our consciousness tends to rest, but instead of living from here, and, and I this is a very vivid image to me and perhaps it can be vivid to you but we're looking out from here so that it's it's like you're 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 projecting your energy outward and upward through the spiritual eye and you actually interact from the world from here you're you're resting here but you're expressing from here and the more we express from the spiritual eye the more the energy interiorizes and ultimately, the irida and the pingula, um, the energy of both enters into the shushumna, and there's a single flow of energy. But in the meantime, the more we can live from this point. So when anything happens to us, and we feel you know, our energy drop, that's what people will say, feel my energy drop. We, you can relax at the medulla, and then from that relaxation, reach out again from the spiritual eye. And the more we can live from this point, the spiritual eye uh, commands all the chakras. And then the upward and downward flow of energy um, interiorly 
it gains, gains great magnetism. It, you know, uh, energy moving in a circle like that creates magnetism. So um, our Kriya practice and a lot of forms of meditation involve either using the breath or other visualizations. We draw energy up the spine and, it, and down again. And we, we make that as a continuous loop. Because what that does is that interiorizes our energy. And then when the interiorization is strong enough and focused enough, then it becomes a single um, rising current upward. But by the time we're there, we're, something else completely is happening. So um, the tortoise is, is that living in the spine, living more in, from the spine is how you have to say it, because we're always uh, having to interact. But this is where the phrase, again, language has it, I feel very off-center, I need to center myself, I need to pull in, you know, like that, those kinds of words, because we feel it. We feel when the sense telephones are just ringing all the time and we're doing nothing but answering them, then the heart also becomes agitated and it begins to be filled with its likes and dislikes. And if you stop and see yourself or anyone like that, off-center is really exactly the right word. Then you pull back and inhale. You pull your energy into the medulla, you relax into the medulla, but then you raise your energy out from the spiritual eye. When, when people die, death is also extremely important for understanding life because the process of how we, of the final withdrawal from this physical body is just um, the same as the withdrawal into the spirit. Um, except, of course, in the final death or the maha samadhi of a great yogi. Maha means the great, the last samadhi, the last experience of cosmic consciousness. The energy is withdrawn and it, it doesn't come back. But it, when you see someone going through the death process, it so vividly illustrates on so many levels, not just physical, but also emotional, psychological, spiritual it's, it so illustrates the choices that we're making all the time. When I have been with individuals as they were passing through those stages, you know, it's, it's natural when a person becomes ill or um, debilitated. They can't do what they've always done before. And oftentimes when a person has a, a diagnosis or recognizes, suddenly the, their whole sense of priority shifts. You know, things that seemed so important and so much to worry about, they just withdraw from those things. And even if they recover, often the threat of, of serious illness, debility, or death is enough to just reorient you. And one begins to, to move back into those things that really matter. And for the devotee, what really matters is, to, is our peace of mind, and our connection to God and our courage in the face of obstacles. Especially you now, this chapter is called The Nature of Right Action. This, this book, uh, in the book, it's called that. And all of these verses in this second chapter of the Gita have all been explaining what it looks like to be centered in God. And what we keep coming up with is this capacity to hold our inner reality no matter how tumultuous it becomes around us. Master's magnificent phrase was uh, to stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. I mean, that's really quite a, a statement. Some friends of ours um, have had a beautiful community on the big island uh, in Hawaii. And unfortunately, their beautiful land has been in the path of this exploding volcano. Um, I don't know what's happening right now. A little while ago, their actual piece of land was not under lava, but lava had virtually surrounded it and, you know, just, it was being destroyed. Just, and our friends who are great yogis, who've poured their heart and soul into creating this beautiful community there, you know, just Mother Nature has just taken it away from them. And it's, of course, ironic because Mother Nature gave it to them also. 
what, what made it so exquisite was the beauty of the natural world there. And, of course, what they added to it. But the foundation of it was the beauty of the natural world, which is not anything we create. That's what God has given to us. And now God has covered it with black rock or surrounded it with black rock. And our friends, the yogis, uh, he was writing just like that. He said it's it sort of, he said one doesn't really quite know which way to respond. He said to, to see virtually one's whole life work destroyed in a matter of days is naturally disconcerting. But to realize how how helpless we are in the face of God's will, expressed in this case through Mother Nature, he said, what is he, why is there, why would one even bother to have an opinion? Why would one even react? Uh, many years ago at Ananda Village, we had a huge forest fire, and uh, we had 900 acres of land at that point, and it burned down 450 of them. And it burned down most of the houses that were in, this, in the community area. A couple of other areas were spared, but it happened just in a matter of hours. You know, everyone woke up in the morning and everything was fine, and when it was time to go to bed at night, it had been totally changed. I, where I lived was not actually burned, but where I work was burned. And I had taken this walk from where I lived to where I worked. I'd taken it every day for years. And I got lost because the whole landscape had just been changed. I started going and I ended up a half a mile from where I was trying to be because I couldn't find my way. It was woods, but the, the trails had been there but I couldn't find the trails. I ended up somewhere completely else. It was so completely changed. But when that fire came too, and I, I can't speak from having lost everything. I had very little, but what little I had was spared. But some of those who lost everything, it was, it was the same moment. It's like, why should I grasp at this fleeting world? You know, Divine Mother gives, Divine Mother takes away. I'm grateful for whatever Divine Mother gives me. Now, I know what I wanted to say, and this is my last point. I want, it's very important. It's not that we try to suppress our natural reaction. Swami himself, when he, he was out of town when that fire struck, and when he came back, he said, you know, he said just emphatically, this is traumatic. He said, a great trauma has happened to us. You know, years of our effort, and, and for many people, all of their personal belongings, virtually, virtually everything, absolutely destroyed. He said, it's traumatic. You can't just pretend as if it doesn't matter. It, it, it wouldn't be human. It wouldn't be natural. So you say, yes, the ball has been hit to a far corner of the, of the court, and for me to reach that, I'm going to have to run harder than I've ever run, and I'm going to have to swing this racket in a way I'm not even really sure that I can do it. This is, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be a great challenge. And it, it, it demands everything of me. But I will try. And that's what we're doing when we're trying to be strong in our center despite what comes to us. We're not stupid. We know that something very difficult has happened. And we also are not naive about what it's going to take for us to be able to stay strong in that. But what we have to become convinced of is that the effort is worth it. And that's, well, that's an advice Swami gave me at one point. We have to practice when it's easier. So that when something comes that is devastating, which like our friends losing their community or this woman I was speaking of her knowing that her life was going to be over, the two months from that point she would be in the astral world and her husband would be left alone. That's, that's shocking. That's traumatic. It's not natural to just say, oh, it's nothing. It's a great deal. But if we have practiced continuously understanding that the best way to meet this kind of a difficulty is to lift our energy as high as we're able to lift it, to rest in the medulla and look at the world through the spiritual eye, and then every other level like picking up a puppet from the right string will fall into order. But it won't disappear, and nor will the effort be small. When the community burned down, we made it through. It, but it happened in June, and by August, we were so tired. That's what I really remember. I remember 
September came and we were exhausted. We had gotten through it. You know, we kept our spirits up. We were putting the community back together. But to hold that attitude took every ounce of energy we had, but it was energy well spent. Because in the end, we would not only have weathered the physical trauma, but we would have gained spiritually. And in the end, that's all you have. God bless you.